And I'm going to call the meeting to order at 9 o'clock. We uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Good morning. I have a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, I'd, I'd move to amend the agenda. Is there a second to agenda? Second. Yeah, second. Okay, can, um, what are your the amendments? Get a vote on it first. Uh, all in favor of amending the agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Doug. Uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, introduce a motion for the Jenkins Point, the design and permitting to fund uh, some of the monies for that. And yeah, that's under new business? Under new business. Thank you. Okay, Colette? Yeah, and I need to um, move the succession planning motion to new business, and that needs to be a first reading. Okay. Are there any other changes to the agenda? Okay, and I, um, we have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I have a motion to approve the minutes from the closed session meeting from March 26, 2021. So moved. Uh, second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Or is there any discussion? Any changes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And uh, I have a motion to approve the minutes from April 21st, 2021, a regular meeting. So, so moved. And is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? Any changes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, under the president's remarks, um, I just have two things. First off, uh, I've confirmed with uh, our general manager that the mask mandate has been lifted in Ocean Pines in compliance with the CDC and the governor's I'm sorry, I'm excited. <laughs> uh, decision last night. It applies to, uh, as the governor's uh, statement said to all individuals who are fully vaccinated and two weeks after they received their second shot. So that's good news. And also, uh, if you didn't see the governor's uh, announcement last night, he has now lifted all uh, uh, capacity restrictions in Maryland also. So that's good news for our clubs uh, and for the pools. Um, and I just wanted to note that the referendum uh, regarding the $1 million spending limit passed. Uh, I want to take a, just a second to thank the Elections Committee for the hard work they did uh, in this process. And I was in and out of the um, counting session yesterday. That committee was there from 1030, counting ballots until 4 p.m. yesterday afternoon. And um, they did it all by hand. They did an outstanding job. I want to thank Steve Habiger and his team for a job well done. John. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let's just start off. There's just a couple of pic pictures of what's going on. Uh, top left, pipeliners, and I'll talk more about that. We've talked in prior board sessions and board gave me the approval to move forward on pipeliners. I'll tell you a lot about that. And there was a lot of neat stuff and some good savings. The right administrating parking lot, I mean, obviously right outside, that's completed, again, updated to the board and within budget. Uh, high Sheriff trail pipes, I've spoken about that several board meetings ago, just wanted to take a picture of that. We are looking at the mailboxes there, as I have said in the past, I, I always like to try to get experience with something that we're looking at down the road, if it's a bigger project and learn from it. I've certainly have on other projects as opposed to just diving into it and not understanding what we've gotten into. So the team is working on that. I hope to have some information on that going forward. The Robin Hood Park Playground, you can see a nice picture of that. Debbie will speak more about that. Turn the page. <clears throat> okay, well, your assessment dollars at work. And this is all about the assessment dollars of all the homeowners of Ocean Ponds. Turn the page. This is the agenda, just an index of what I'll talk about today. Aquatics, uh, public works, Finance, Rec and Parks, Debbie will handle that along with other, her other responsibilities. Turn the page. Okay, DMA study, it's that time of the year. We promised that uh, Budget and Finance, they had asked me to um, do a review. 
We did want to do what I called a DMA study light from several years ago. And we mentioned that. I mentioned that when I was chair of BNF. So, you know, I appreciate that BNF has brought that forward and all the, all the work that they will do over the next month or two with us. So with that said, we, we hired uh, DMA, Doug Green, again. He did complete the review of the buildings, drainage, roads, and bulkheads uh, between April 12th through the 16th. He is still working on it. The bulkheads draft report, we received that. Nobi and the team is reviewing that for me, and we're discussing that. DMA roads, the study is in progress. We're waiting for uh, Doug to get back to us on that. Uh, also, the overall draft of the reserves, similar, similar to last time, to be completed by Doug, DMA, by the end of May. So, right, so they have the proprietary software, and that's something that obviously is good to outsource to them. And he'll do a new recalculation of, you know, the changes we've made with the construction we've done, as well as other items and fine tuning things that we've had from the past. The team will present, <coughs> excuse me, the general reserve study to the budget and finance committee in early June. The reserve study to be presented to the board at either the June 15th or July 21st board meeting. It'll probably be the July uh, board meeting. Okay, so a good tool, team's on it. I appreciate the budget and finance support. Aquatics. So an update on aquatics, and I know we just sent out, Josh sent out a, a press release for me last night. Um, so where are we? So the outdoor pools will be opening Saturday, May 29th. The only restriction at the outdoor pools is masks. Well, that's being addressed. Obviously, things are changing to be worn in the bathrooms. Lounge chairs will go out and we will operate without capacity limitations. Everything is on schedule. We are hiring and training, in-service training. I know I've gotten questions about that. Kathleen has addressed it. She's on it. It's scheduled for May 22nd and the 23rd. Pool hours are returning to pre-COVID hours. Please see the website where everything is listed. All permits have been applied for beach parking and pools. Family fun night will re resume. It'll be Wednesdays at 6 o'clock. Yacht Club pool. Parks and recs will be bringing camp kids to Mumford's and swim and racket on Tuesdays. This is a return to pre-COVID life. So it's good to see just like everywhere else in this uh, great nation, that we ourselves also are returning to pre-COVID. We're still very short of swim instructors. We are advertising for staff through all Ocean Pines options. Due to the shortage, we're not offering group swim lessons. Turn the page. Uh, I, think we, I think we skipped the page. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so Public Works, the pipeline. So this is the big one. Um, so we did come, we received approval. Uh, we looked at 10 pipes with this pipeline of process that I've explained in the past, and I will talk a little bit about it again today in case somebody missed it. But this, this, this type of process uh, alleviates us digging up the roads. It's a shorter process. It, it, it's cheaper, and personally, everybody feels that it's a, it's a better pipeliner at the end, which I'll show and we'll talk about. Um, we did get an endorsement. I did ask for an endorsement from um, from Vista. They, they sent us a letter. They, they backed this product as well as the county had used them and Ocean City had used something similar. We did a lot of research on them and what we've seen is very positive. So what did we do? So the pipes that we approached first, you probably saw the work. And if anybody has passed and seen at Route 90, right there, there are four key pipes. And I'll show you a picture. Uh, that go ocean that go on to Ocean Parkway, and uh, those were the first ones that were done, and they were successful. It might have took a little time because it was the first one for them, um, but it was very successful, and I think we have a great product there. And, and I'll show you the pictures. And it's probably something that's going to last a very long time. And all of these pipes were done probably at half the price that it would have take, taken us with the old conventional way. So then they proceeded to do these other pipes. They're all listed there, uh, pretty much all Ocean Parkway, you know, or anywhere where we saw that if we did have to do them and some of them were coming up, uh, that it would have taken a lot of uh, disruption to Ocean Parkway. So the budget, when I came forward to the board, and what I said we were going to spend was somewhere around two hundred seven, two hundred eight thousand dollars dollars We came in on this process at 212000 the reason is this, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit more about the process, but we did have to buy more ice to stabilize the product uh, based upon conditions. We also uh, had to go out and rent a uh, vacuum truck 
uh, for a couple of days because of the amount of uh, dirt or silt or whatever that had uh, had uh, built up inside the pipe. So there was a lot more than, than anticipated. So that was the cost there, uh, which could probably go into maintenance of, of the ditches. But it came out to 212, and that's where we're at on this. Turn the page, we'll see some really neat pictures. Quick question. And sure. Just, yeah. Didn't don't we have a pipe that uh, a, a vacuum truck that vacuums out the the culvert pipe staff anyway? Didn't so we we, we, we and you're right. We do have equipment to do that. I, the question was actually asked. We don't have the type of equipment, the type of truck uh, that Ocean City has and that the county has and that we rented, okay. which was needed for this bigger project. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 One other but we do have something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. One other question. Sure. The two hundred twelve thousand dollars. How many lineal feet of pipe did that repair? So I can get, I, Frank, I can get that for you. We have it. I just don't have it right now, but I can get that for you. Another question. Sure. The um, the foam, lo the stuff that they're using to actually insulate before, while they put the liner in. Oh, you're right. Is it, is, is that recyclable? Does, does it go directly to, I mean, is there any fee, extra fee for disposing of that? Is there anything with that that has a, this, any, cause I saw a lot of it in the public work chart when I was there dumping yeah. Leaves and pine needles. So I, I will find that out. Yeah, um, appreciate it. I'll find that out for you. I never heard that. Hold yeah. on one second. I just don't know what it's made yeah, of. Yeah. I'm wondering whether we're going to get hit with any kind of waste disposal thing at the That's county. a good question. I'll, I'll find that out. Thanks. I mean, nobody said anything to me about it. Okay. But we can get it. Thanks. Appreciate it. Michelle, you just have that listed. Okay. No, good question. All right. So so where are we? Hold on. Let me turn the page. A couple of pictures. So the picture on the left there, you actually see those are the four pipes at Ocean Parkway right near the 90 bridge, if anybody wants to look at them. Um, those were the first ones we did. So that, that's the, the team from uh, Pelican, I believe the name is, uh, that came in from Louisiana that we hired. Uh, and that's their team, their truck in the background, all the equipment that's needed for this process. Uh, we did have members, which we negotiated from the beginning. Some of our team that helped out, Justin uh, and his team that work on drainage did assist with this, and we saved money with that process. So when you look to the right, what, what Tom was talking about, you can see as they proceeded with this liner, it is a pretty neat process. Uh, we all watched it. Uh, Eddie was there, Noby and myself, especially the first day, to ensure uh, that everything would be good. And uh, we saw something, Eddie had to help out with the ice, but after that, we had no problem. So that's the process. There's the next page as, as this comes together. So. So what happens is once they clean out, I'm sorry, Michelle, just go back to the first page. So what happens is once they clean out the pipe, they set up this coffer dam. I'm not sure if you, in the next slide that you can see it, but obviously they had to stop the water to the right that runs under 90. So there was a big process. One of the reasons why did these pipes took the longest. Um, they slide this, this, this product, which is enclosed in this, uh, this white fabric that Tom's, Tom mentioned. They slide it. It's a pretty neat. They slide it all the way through the pipe. First, obviously, they, they inspect the pipes, which they did even before they came in, when they came up to evaluate the, the job. So they slide this through, and then the, the, the truck on the left with all the compressors and everything, they build up the compression for the sleeve, which then molds right to the, to the uh, pipe. And then I'll show you the next process because there's more to it. you got to be a chemist. Turn the page. So on the left there, that's the actual cured liner. Sorry. That's actually, that's actually the cured liner at the end, the polyurethane. So there is a process. Once it goes in there, first they got to stabilize it at a certain temperature. That's why the ice is needed. Then they put this liner through. There's a heat process. There's obviously the compression. It builds up within the pipe. I actually had a, uh, an example that I left on my desk. You can see this. I've had it. I've shown it to a lot of people, especially board members. This thing is tough as iron um, and will last a lot longer. Picture on the right, there's your four pipes. You can see if you look on the, to my left there, you can kind of see uh, the liner where it extended out from the old pipes. And that's your product. And the pipes are flowing and the water's flowing. Okay, turn the page. It's really neat. We're gonna, we're gonna get this company back next year, hopefully. Okay, so, so there's the pipeline. Is the next one with the drainage is the Bainbridge project. So I just wanted to give the, uh, the board and the association some numbers and where we're at with it. And it's, it is on track, it is on budget, and it's green. 
the the time period is we're, we're scheduled. They're scheduled to be completed by the end of June. Right now, we're on track for that, if not a little earlier. There were some things that came they came across, whether it was a gas line or a few other items that might have, you know, a little change or shift, but uh, totally on target. So the grant was 482000 The budget, we had allocated Ocean Pines somewhere around 235, 250,000, right? We talked about Bainbridge Light and what we were gonna do. Uh, the contract with EQR, who's doing the project is 500, roughly 535,000. The first payment was submitted for reimbursement. So we've paid EQR and, we, and we've submitted the reimbursement uh, with the county. So we're in that process right now. So in the past, how much did we spend on this, on the overall project that one time was a little bigger? We spent about $125,000 with Vista and around $30,000, $32,000 with the county. Turn the page. John. Yes. I'm asking this just because I really don't know, but does what, if any, effect does this pipeline project have on the Bainbridge project? Is, is there any benefit or, or anything to it? So you're talking about the pipeliners? Yeah. So, and, and, you know, so, so, you know, there is a, a huge drainage and pipe um, infrastructure in Ocean Pines. Right. Obviously, doing the Bainbridge project itself helps with drainage, not just in that area, but everywhere to some degree. The same thing with those pipes. Now, some of those pipes, and they, they, that water may be going somewhere else. But in general, anytime we do anything to improve any infrastructure there, it helps Ocean Pines. But it is a huge infrastructure. So it's not like it's. I can sit here and say that that pipe, those pipes are going exactly into the Bainbridge pond. There's a whole maze and everything. Thank but you. But it for does that. help. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So let's see. Let me get my bear. So all right. So on the left, we have a four bay. This is what they're they're, they're building in four bay. <laughs> Somebody told me there was four bays. It's not. It's one bay. Uh, it's an inlet of the pond where. Filtration takes place before entering the main pond, which is on the right. Completion by May 12th, uh, separated by a dirt berm. So, right, so, so what happens is what you want to do, and, if, and I know it's down at 50, Route 50, if you may ever make that turn off 589, you can see if you look on the right on the ditch there, they kind of have the filtration. They have one layer, one layer, one layer. And anytime you have that, you have better filtration. And that's one of the, the big items of this whole drainage and this whole project is to get filtration, to get the water cleaner as it goes out to the bay. So the water comes out from all these ditches, goes into that four bay on the left. You can, hard, you can just about see it where they, they have like a, a berm. And then the water, there'll be plants there. And the water will filtrate into the main pond. That main pond will have what they call benches, and if you read on the bottom. So if you go down there now before they, the water's in there and everything, and you look around the circumference of the, the main pond and even the other one, it's kind of like what they call a bench or a platform. That's where they're going to plant and all the plants will be, which is a big part of this. And that will all help with the filtration. So if you look down to the right, and I believe I have another slide for it, when the water leaves the main pond, it'll be the same thing. There'll be an overflow. Michelle, turn the page, please. I believe I have a picture of it. So on there on the left, right, in the far back, you can see the crane that was working on the berm and working on the forebay that I told you about. And then you see the water there, that little bit, that's the main pond. And then if you look to the top right corner there, you see a little sandy spot. It's a little lighter before you get to that tree and everything in the orange. That's the bench that I talked about. And then when you come towards me, you see the, uh, I don't know what those are, the sandbags, big sandbags they look like, which are in place as they build this, this, this they call it an outfall. So there'll be an outfall structure. The water will go over that. And then to the right, you see the two pipes there. They will be replaced. And then water will go through there. There's three other pipes that I have listed on the bottom. Beacon Hill, Sandy Hook, and the next time I come in, We'll have pictures of that, and then the water will continue from there, and then out towards the uh, uh, Doug. Yeah, John. Quick question. So, sure. um, you're going to replace those two pipes with you're going to replace the whole pipe rather than doing the liner when there was. Yeah, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. So that was all. We already had that. Yeah, we're going to okay. replace it with, with the, the, the 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 old way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 
They're also, it's going to be, I believe it's going to be different sized pipes and stuff, but I'll have more update on that next okay. time. Yeah. And then there's, I'll have pictures where that will go down to those three sections that I have on the bottom and we'll show that as it goes all the way out to, to uh, when it's way towards the, uh, the bay. All righty. So hopefully I gave you a good idea of that now. Um, next month, I'll have the rest of the pictures and where the next one is June. Probably, I'm hoping it'll be done by then. Okay. You know, hey, John, when that's finished, um, I know Tom has made a point to us multiple times that this is basically a water filtration project. Right. And I think it would be good to have some narrative from Vista Engineering on exactly how much flood control we're going to get out of this. Because my understanding is flood control is really going to be quite minimal. Okay. Michelle, please write that down. But it is, it's all about filtration, you're right. You know. But it's all about moving a lot of water into places and having it filter through and then the excess to go out. So that's why we're doubling up the ponds, going to make those pipes bigger, putting in, putting in the ladder system to actually have the water absorbed by as it's going in so you don't have as much just filtered into a pond and overflowing into the backyard. Right. right. And, and the reason I want to yeah. that, Tom, is you know the first time we get a big rain and you get flooding down there, Rather right. than somebody come back and say, well, you just wasted a half million dollars for something that didn't work. Yeah, it's not a waste. But they understand exactly what right. the intent of the it's project filtration. was. Right. And what I would recommend, if you go over to the Bishopville prong over off, when you're going into Bishop, when you're going into Bishopville right there, as you go over the end of St. Martin's River, they put a million five into that filtration system coming because the chicken farms are up in Sussex County. They have signs and things and we might want to do that or get a grant for educational signs to show what each portion of this is doing for people walking the pond area. Give them an idea that it's not just for flooding, but what it's doing to keep the rivers clean as well. I mean, it's really cool if you ever get a chance to go up there and look at what it does for the spawning of the fish and, and keeping the water clean. So we might want to think of that down oh, the definitely. road. Just Michelle, just put that down. We'll, get pic we'll try to get pictures of that yeah, too. Yeah, I have them somewhere if I can find yeah, them. Yeah, I'll go over there with no. Yep. Okay, right, so we'll talk about it next time. I'll have, the pi I'll have the pictures of the rest of the project. Hopefully it's done. A focus on the filtration information you all you all have requested, as well as try to get pictures and uh, stuff from that other place. Yep, all good stuff. Okay, front page. All right, where am I? Finance. All right, finance uh, always in the news, but obviously we've come to the uh, to the end of our fiscal year. So what's going on with finance right now? So the year end audit is uh, in 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 process in progress. TGM on on new auditors are on site for preliminary audit procedures. They've been here, they were here April 19th. Um, it's internal control documentation, questionnaires, walkthrough procedures. Now they are a new firm. However, they've been here in the past, so we didn't lose any continuity or anything like that bringing, in, bringing TGM in. Uh, they're doing the inventory test counts April 3rd, you know, they did it April 30th at the end of the year. This is all standard procedures that have happened in the past. Just trying to give an update on where we are with that. Uh, right now, not anticipating any situations or anything. Um, have spoken to the partner there, Chris Hall. Uh, the biggest thing that would be different from prior years is obviously the PPP, which I've talked about in prior board meetings, but I will touch on again now. Okay. North Star, I know I always get a lot of questions on North Star. Our team updates me. We did have a retirement. Uh, Steve Grabowski retired, so we did lose uh, a very good resource on that. He has volunteered to come back to help us uh, if we need, and we have a new person in place. But as far as an update from the last update I gave last month, it's basically still proceeding. No substantial change from the last month's report. Um, but we're working on it. So it's basically what I told you all last month. Any questions on that? I'll repeat, you know, I'll repeat anything if anybody wants it. Okay. PPP, right? Payroll Protection Plan. Payroll. So forgiveness application and backup support provided to the Bank of Ocean City in mid-March. Steve and his team put that together, uh, submitted. We've kept BNF updated over several months. That's when we said we would submit it. Uh, the Bank of Ocean City provided the application and support to SBA, small business, on 316. Small business has 90 days to provide response letters, so will likely be determined prior to issuance of year-end audited financials, but obviously after our year-end. So the last board meeting, I spoke about all the different scenarios. If uh, 
what would happen if it was forgiven, how would we would account for it if it was forgiven before year end, right? So if it's forgiven before year end, it's revenue. And it would be just what I've been reporting, what we've been reporting every month. If, it's, if we have not heard anything by the time we close the books, there will be a footnote. There'll be a footnote either way, but there will be a footnote in the audited financial statements uh, reviewed by the auditors uh, telling about the situation. Because if this isn't received, it's a loan. It's a loan at, I believe, 1% mm -hmm. that we pay over X amount of time. If it's not approved or not forgiven, our revenue or the numbers that I have been giving you, and I'll talk about that in, in, in my last slide, that would have a million one effect on our operating profit for this year. And we either pay off the loan or we pay it over time at 1%. Okay? And, and so that is something I'll talk more when I have you the slide where I give you the estimates, exactly what I showed everybody last month. Anybody have any questions on this? Because this would be a big effect on our operating profit, our balance sheet, if it's not forgiven. It would be a million one. We, we have, or the matter what company did receive forgiveness on their PPP money of approximately $270,000, $275,000. That will be reflected in the food and beverage numbers. We have received forgiveness or approval on the Affordable Care, I believe it's the Affordable Care Act, we've submitted somewhere around 130,000. We've already received approval somewhere around 70, 90,000. That'll show you, which would be in our P&L as favorability, okay? John, at the risk of sounding overly optimistic, it would seem from what we're reading online and my husband gets in his MBA journals that the, there is a lot of favorability and forgiveness on the PPP loans. And I hope that'll be our case here. So, you know, it's a good segue for me. So what, what is the PPP plan all about? Right? It's about payroll. It's about utilizing these funds for payroll. We have used 100% of the million 143 for payroll for salaries. This was a plan. This was a stimulus by the government, by the U.S. government for payroll for salaries for associations, organizations, corporations, companies, whatever, to keep the employees employed during a tough situation. We have adhered to that 100%. Okay, thank you. Turn the page. Oh, okay. So with that, uh, with my uh, next manager up, Debbie has volunteered to um, present today. She'll present her, her, her areas. I'm hoping to get a different director. Um, each time I try to do this, um, trying to get volunteers. But with that, Debbie. Sure. Thank you. Good morning. So I just am um, going to go over recreation and parks <clears throat> first. Um, last time, um, last month, we talked about the lights being replaced in the gym. Um, we did that with um, new, more efficient, call, better cost, um, and actually safer. Um, with LED lights, they do not have the bulbs in them. So, you know, um, breaking bulbs in a gym with balls and basketballs and all that kind of stuff, um, it's not really safe. So we did do that replacement. They look great. Um, you actually could probably land an airplane in there. It's so bright now. Um, <laughs> but, but it worked out really great. Um, so anyway, we did have a ribbon cutting on May the 10th at Robin Hood. Um, you saw the picture of it earlier in the slides. Um, that turned out really great. Uh, we had some kids and some parents that came out to help us with that. Um, the cost originally was $49,375. It had um, gone up by $2,000 because we had to delay it through the COVID situation. Um, and then the cost of the mulch, it, it turned out to be $51,000. Um, we saved quite a bit because we have not done Bainbridge yet. Um, that program has kind of taken a turn, and we are going to look at doing some different things over there versus just putting a playground back. Um, and replacing what was already there. Um, pretty much all the mulching is done for the playgrounds and parks everywhere. There may be a couple of spots they're still trying to get the levels and stuff in, but pretty much that's all done. As John said, the paving in the parking lot is complete. Um, we did gain 16 par parking spaces um, when we redid the parking lot and taking out the old craft building. We do have a couple of things that still need to be done out there, but they're going to return and, and finish up the project. Uh, summer concerts, um, thank you, Lord, are back this summer. 
They will start June 24th. Um, as Kathleen put in, Family Fun Night is back at the Yacht Club. It'll start on June 23rd. And summer camp, it will start June 21st. Now, yes, a lot of regulations have changed um, in the last couple of days. Um, however, the state health department that runs my summer camp has yet to give me new restrictions and new guidelines for summer. I am still at half capacity until they send me something telling me I can open up and have at it. Um, there are 50 people on the wait list right now, and we will be able to accommodate those 50 as soon as I get the, the go ahead to do so. But right now we are still at half capacity for that. And I can't, it's completely regulated differently than just saying you can have this room full of people again. It's just completely different. Okay. Um, at the Marina, um, they are doing really well. They opened on May 1st. Um, so for May, the first couple of weeks, this number is only from May 1st until the 12th. Um, so they're doing really good in fuel sales. Got a little nervous last week when um, we weren't getting fuel anywhere, but uh, Ron had a great relationship with Croppers, and um, they did deliver fuel to us on Friday. So we we were in good shape at least for the for the weekend, and then now obviously that's kind of changed as well. So um, all the marina slips are full in both marinas. Um, the Fuel dock is open right now from 8 to 6, but those hours change on Memorial Day weekend. They will start at 6 to 6, and that'll go all the way through till uh, the September and um, October. The, the, the dates, I mean, the, the opening and closing times will be a little bit different then. Um, I did want to make a, a note that, unfortunately, the TDOC project is not happening right now, um, so it's not going to be implemented for the summer. But I wanted to make a note that please understand that all the slips are rented and they are only open to those that have paid their fees, have turned in their rental agreements, registration, insurance, all of those things. They are that you cannot put another boat in a, a slip, even if no one's there, um, because each one of those slips are insured to a person that has rented it and paid for it. We do, however, have three T docks that are open for temporary usage that can be open and hold seven up to seven, depending on size um, boats. And there's also two spaces at the Mumford's ramp that they can um, pull up on, you know, for dining at the Yacht Club and temporary usage, um, you know, and then um, move on out and let someone else use the spaces. I just wanted to state that because we do have, we do have um, some issues in the summer and um, I, I, it's just the regulations that I have to go by and Ron has to go by and Tom. Are those are the T docks regulated to seven slips, or is that just people that don't know how to dock their boat? Yes. <laughs> okay, because I know you. No, can get that is in Ron. Ron, when I talked to Ron about it, he said approximately seven. Okay. All you right. know what I mean? So it just, just one. It's it, on size, and two on how you put your boat in there. <laughs> just to say it out loud to yep, all no. you people, because I like to dock there too. You yes. can do four, three, and three. Just yes. Be cognizant of your other boaters. Yeah. The park and dock correctly, and yeah. you can get turned in there. <laughs> And we do have people that are, they come in together and they, and, and oh, they yeah, stack I, this way. Yeah, you I, know what I mean? So I've um, up many people. that's, that's basically the number. And then you navigate it from there. Um, so let's see. And racket sports. Um, the resurfacing of the tennis courts is complete. Um, ter terra firma is um, continuing to work on the pickleball courts. There was a, a, a little bit of a problem this week, so they're having to come back so that we can um, make some adjustments. So that will continue um, at some point next week. Um, so as I put here for the new pickleball courts, um, obviously these statements are made by Vista, but I couldn't kind of word these any different that they were going to make sense. So I just, I just went with the statements that I had gotten back from them. Um, so where we stand right now with the new pickleball courts, obviously, is to date they have completed the wetland delineation. The field survey is required to prepare a base sheet suitable for design. We have also coordinated with Dave Bradford of Worcester County regarding his requirements for location of all new improvements so as to allow him to permit the construction near and in the critical area. So where they're at is in the back side, all the way on the opposite side, closest to public works. And in that area, they have the county has asked us each time we've added to the racket center, um, I need you to do this. I need the I need the um, drainage area put in. I need these little trees put in. All the things that they asked us to do in the past, because we've added more courts of different types out there, the county needed to, us to show 
where every one of those things have been done because we're now trying to infringe on those things and requirements that they've asked us to do. So it's taken a little bit longer. They had to come back out and resurvey, make sure and take pictures that we've done everything that they've asked us to do. And then all of that now has to be sent down to them and they have to go through it, make sure all those things are done and where we now can put the new courts out there. Um, we are hoping that it stays within the county and that the county is able to approve it without it having to go to the state only, you know, because they can, it doesn't have to go to the state as long as it's not infringing into the critical area. And there's a lot of wetland area back there. So we have, you know, it, it's not just as easy as saying, yes, you can put it there. It actually has to meet their standards. And we all already know that. So um, they hope to have the conceptual design next week and they can share it with Ocean Pines. Following everyone's okay, we will finalize the plans, process through Worcester County critical areas planning, and as well go through Worcester County Soil Conservation District. So we're getting there, but as I said, it's just taken a little bit longer because we have to show all the things that we've done in the past in order for us to expand. Debbie, yes, um, ma'am. I wanna thank you for coming to the RAC Center this week and doing the, being there to hear the progress that that center has made and the new mm -hmm. ideas that they have for enhancing their revenue stream. Mm -hmm. um, I have <coughs> responded to many complaints about the parking over at the Racket Center. For those of you that may be there or have driven by it in very busy hours, the parking is all the way out to Manklin Parkway. And there is a uh, playground there, which doesn't make for a good mix of children running out in the middle of the road mm -hmm. while people are trying to get out of there. So we also are looking, with Debbie's help, of where there can be additional parking there whether it's accessing a road that leads down into the dog park or whether it's putting it somewhere else. So that, that seems to be one of the major complaints, but we are trying to address that as well. Yeah, and I have um, looked at different signage, the, you know, the little, the little guy that has a little flag that's trying to tell you this is a children's area, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, those things are actually very hard to find. Um, and, and we do have new signage and things that is gonna go up, but you know, apparently, um, we are not able to put in speed bumps. Um, the county says no to those. So um, we're just trying to figure out how we can make more spaces, not have the cars next to the parking or the playground, and not have children, you know, taking that risk of running between cars. Um, Debbie, because could, it, there is a lot of a lot of people that come in and out of there. When you get 150 people playing at the racket center every day in the summertime, it, it is hard to accommodate all these vehicles. Should we look at? putting a, a barrier fence up there, John. I mean, if we're, if we're that concerned about children running out into the street and I've been down there and it, you know, that's a big playground, it may be something we need to look at from a safety standpoint. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Larry, I agree with you and so yeah. does Debbie um, when it comes to safety or anything, but we will look at that. We'll definitely look at that, um, yes. We're going to we're going to get a new mic <laughs> um, as far as beautification of Ocean Pines. Um, we have replaced some of the flowers at the golf course um, on the 18th hole. I'm sorry. Ten. Sorry. Um, I don't know all my holes yet over there. So I'm not sure where all the things are. Um, and there's a, there's a few ladies at the golf course that takes care of the flower beds and the weeding um, of the golf course at different holes, um, along with the golf maintenance and public works. We're working on different things um, out there that, you know, will not be overgrown, that can kind of sustain themselves a little bit with a little bit of maintenance um, for the longevity versus it looks really cute now, but um, it doesn't last as long. So um, but they are working on that. Um, the work group is gathering new ideas um, to make the entranceways um, a lot more inviting and attractive as you're coming in. Um, we're looking at different ways that we can not spend a ton of money, but also um, bring those up to life again. Um, the cherry blossom trees, they look great on Cathal Road if you've seen them. Um, they're also going to be placed around the uh, pool side, if you will, of the uh, Southgate Pond, and um, that's going to be that's going to be beautiful. 
Um, we're putting, now that this project done, is done here, all the buildings are done and the paving is complete, we are now mm -hmm. um, getting a new front entrance sign um, that is gonna be made much more um, structurally sound. No, there won't be as much maintenance that needs to happen to it. And you know, most of the people don't even know that there's a sign there because it's been so long since it's been replaced. So that's going to um, be probably by the end of June. We all know how delivery goes. So as long as we can get the concrete um, pedestals done and, uh, and the delivery of the sign, we should be done by the end of June um, to put the new sign out at the admin opening. So any questions for me? And I'm all set. Thank you, Debbie. So just before I get into the financial, I just want to talk about a couple of things. Backtrack, the beautification. It was an initiative I started. Uh, we, The money that we've used for it. And first of all, I have no problem getting people from my team to volunteer for that project, that initiative. And uh, it's really good. We've The funds that we've used for that is from the landscaping budgets. And we will continue to do that and hopefully do more. Very excited about the cherry blossom trees. I think it's going to give a beautiful look to that pond area coming off 589. Uh, what Debbie mentioned, the garden, which is off of 10, is really for the restaurant, for the, the view of the people sitting on the deck there. And that whole side area there is all going to be a garden. We've been working on that. So that's coming along nice, and we will continue to improve on that. Okay, so with that, I had said I would talk about the financials. Um, we do not have, the April is not closed, it's year end, it's uh, not uncommon. It's been the situation since I've been here. Uh, it's all part of the process with the audit. So I do not have uh, April 30th final financials for today. What I do have is a forecast, uh, which is a high level to give the board and the association an idea on where we are, uh, because that is very important to me and it's very important to the association. So with that, um, this is the slide that I gave last month as a forecast, along with the uh, March financials. So what I wanna do here, first off, is give you the forecast on where we are, what we believe pre-audit, pre-audit, where we are on favorability, to our operating budget. So where we are right now, what we believe will be once, the, obviously 4.30 has passed, but we, you know, we're working on the close. We believe we will be favorable to budget 1.1 million. So, so that's a big number. And I wanna explain that number like I have, you know, and I talked about it a little bit before. So we've navigated through COVID-19 without a playbook for something like that, like everybody else. And we tried to make sure that we would not have a runaway freight train with our expenses and anything else. We had plans, we, we did cost control, we cut back, maybe sometimes we cut back a little more. We had situations with hiring people, laborers, uh, and there's a couple of reasons for it with uh, public works that we're trying to correct. Um, as well as other things. We did shut down expenses, but we kept everybody employed 100%. So the 1 million 150, let's break that down first as far as with the stimulus money that we received, right? So for this schedule here, the PPP money at this time, you all know it's 1 million 143. That's what we received. And again, it depends on if it's forgiven or not. If it's not forgiven, that 1 million 150 we subtract the 1,143 from it, okay? The food and beverage PPP, which uh, the Madoa company received and it's baked into their numbers, was 271,000. That has been forgiven. So that will be, that will be in our revenue numbers, our, our, our operating property. The same thing with the coronavirus relief with the Affordable Care Act. Um, like I had mentioned, probably we've put in for around, we've gotten 105, around 70,000, 90,000 of that, uh, and we'll have the final numbers next time, has been uh, forgiven or approved. So first I just wanna show you, if we had not received any stimulus money this year, with all the cost cutting and everything else, and I'll break down high level for you all, you know, what we lost and where we lost it, 
we would have lost 370,000. We already know now that the 271, and, and let's say the 100 is forgiven, right? So that's 371. So what we're forecasting is that if the PPP money is not forgiven, we believe we will come basically flat on the budget, all right? If the PPP money is not forgiven, then obviously subtract 1 million one. Any questions? Okay, good. So let me give you some highlights now, what we do believe and what caused all this for the year. And again, what I'm saying is even, you know, we believe we should be fine. If I just look high level at the numbers and what you're probably going to see, where did we lose money from operating profit or the budget last year? Well, if you take aquatics, if you take beach parking, because obviously with aquatics, we were limited to what, 50%? There, there was many limitations there in aquatics. Um, so to, to budget, we're, we're anticipating somewhere around 175, 200,000 loss or unfavorability for, for aquatics. Beach parking, somewhere around 180,000 for the year, you know, unfavorable to uh, the budget. Food and beverage, because this $271,000 is baked in their numbers, unlike the rest of the numbers, they came, they kind of come in uh, kind of flat, but they would have lost that plus more. So it's mainly those two items, those two areas where we came in unfavorable. That's offset by rec and parks, where with decreasing all the programs and everything, there is a lot of expense with all that. So we definitely had a plan that we had a plan in our team and we definitely uh, saved on that as well as in other areas. Again, everybody was fully employed. Uh, public works, we weren't able to fill positions, which you all know from the budget process for next year. We had a tough time filling them, getting laborers or even getting work done because of COVID. Uh, but not just because of COVID, we also have seen a situation and we are addressing and you'll probably hear me come back in a few months. Uh, the minimum wage that we pay for the laborers, we're just not finding anybody. And that's not any different than anywhere else, or whether it's servers or any uh, or other type of employees on that. So that's something for another day. So that that's pretty much it, all right? We'll have the financials. That's pretty much where we're at. Any questions on that high level? Frank. John, so to put all this kind of in perspective, uh, with now into the COVID, apparently right on us, right? right. Uh, we would anticipate beach parking to kind of come back. Yeah, so I, I actually was going to say it, we, uh, and I'll give you what we've seen so far, and Ruth Ann updates me on this on a routine basis. The beach parking is, to use Ralph's line, knocking it out of the park. Gotcha. We have gotten numbers so far that Ruth Ann said she has to go back to see when the last time we had numbers this high. To me, that's a big time metric gotcha. of where we're, where we're going to be for this peninsula. But given that, the other thing is we seem to have a structural loss in aquatics, even with a comeback from the yeah. numbers we've seen. No yes. matter what happens, aquatics will not make a net off, will not comply with our, as you call them, scrolls, M02. Correct. Correct. And we are, you're right. The aquatics number that I gave you was was the unfavorable to budget, but into the, what you called the structure of it, uh, aquatics I think was was scheduled to lose three eighty. Right? No, no. Without the COVID, they they were they were scheduled to lose about one thirty, one thirty. Yeah. So with the COVID, you're right with the number three fifty. So you're right. There is a baked in number besides the COVID. Yes. So, uh, and I guess the bottom line is from. Coming out of COVID, we still may we still have a structural problem with aquatics that needs to be addressed to bring it in line with what it's supposed to be M zero two, and we might, but it's kind of iffy right now. Have one also with golf, but golf looks like it's going to make M zero two. So let's talk about that because I, I want to I want I want to I do want to talk about the aquatics and the racket sports. Now that you're bringing it up, I wasn't going to do it today. The golf, the golf for what did I just close out? 2021. We're scheduled to only lose. We're we're only going to be around fifty thousand dollars 
But to budget, golf is going to be, you know, probably 30,000, 40,000 unfavorable. And golf lost the month of May last year and June, six weeks. And we're basically coming in on budget. Um, I got to tell you, and again, you want to talk about metric. I was down here yesterday. They had 236 golfers yesterday. They're going to do the same today. So those are all numbers that we did golf didn't have last year. So what I'm going to, based upon your question, I'm going to answer it. Golf doesn't have a structural problem anymore. Golf is fixed. We're, if, if, not, if, if we didn't lose six weeks last year, I believe I would have been sitting here with that team telling you we made, a, we made profit and favorability. I believe that's going to happen next year. Golf is fixed. And I, I will be glad to tell anybody here why golf is fixed. Golf is fixed because this board, the association, my team, myself have come forward. We've invested money in there. And let's put the, let's put the clubhouse to the side because that's another thing. But the clubhouse is huge. We, we bought equipment that we, we were able to use to cut the rough so that the rough isn't this tremendous height that the golfers don't want to play in. We have, we have gotten the proper equipment that we need for the greens. And it's just one of the many reasons why the greens are where they are. If you've been down there, and I haven't played golf in a year, but if you've been down there, I go down there, the feedback I'm getting from everybody is the greens are in the best shape that they've been in, in seven years. Now, granted, I have something in August that I have to watch for that, I, that we are trying to correct and I'm not blaming anybody that has developed over seven years. I've gone through all this with everybody and anybody else that wants to talk with it. We're addressing it. We believe we have it corrected, but I've all, we've only been doing it for a year. And we're trying to correct something that has evolved over seven years. Um, but we are. So the golf experience for everybody, it's, it's awesome. The clubhouse, the feedback I get, I've been sitting in there. Debbie, in fact, yesterday was there. Uh, the outside play that's there talking about the clubhouse, the positive, positive feedback on that, the course, it's challenging, the best shape. Anybody that's been down here playing, they're coming back. I believe the structure is fixed there. That same formula that we did there, we've applied to racket sports. Since the day I went down there in April, there's cracks, the, the paint, the, the fence was, there was so much stuff. This board, this association, the team and everything, we're addressing it. We're fixing it. There's other stuff there structurally uh, from management and everything that we're working on. And Debbie will get that there. So we believe that will come. As far as the aquatics, well, again, um, you're right. There's two pieces there, but we're working on it. That's going to take some time. Uh, obviously, if you're losing money, we have to make decisions on you know, the price what, how much we charge or what exactly we, we want to do or what our policy is with aquatics. Now, I can tell you this, you know, we are and I've been mandated and uh, Kathleen to look at expenses and we've been doing that and we've been looking at the revenue. But when I get feedback, you know, I, I and I'll be coming forward with this more about certain situations or from an advisory committee, that's going to add costs. And I don't have a problem with it if it's truly needed for safety if it's truly needed. But we do have to look at that. And I can't guarantee that I'll be able, what is it, MO2 or whatever, that I will be able to bring that in this time period um, to what MO2 says that all my amenities have to be you know, budget neutral. But we're working on it. Yeah. But I guess the good news for the association is for the first time since I've lived here in 2013, it is realistic to say that if you fix aquatics, every amenity will comply with the scrolls of M02. Yeah. yeah. But I need time. We know how to do it. Okay. Any other questions on this? this is big. Um, I'm not anticipating any big audit adjustments or anything. You know, like I said with the PPP, I really thought I would have an answer by now. Um, the good thing is, is that. Um, Talking to some some other businesses that I know around here, theirs was forgiven. Uh, the feedback we've gotten from the bank is that we're in no different situation than anybody else. And again, I can just can't repeat it enough. We used every dollar for what that stimulus plan was mandated for, for salaries, <laughs> payroll. 
That's it. Doug, Treasurer's report. So uh, as John had noted in his uh, GM report, uh, they are going through the uh, audit. Uh, they're trying to close the books for the month of April. So we don't have any slides that would uh, be able to represent uh, the, you know, the close of the uh, fiscal month. So uh, again, we'll look at that as, as things go forward. I did want to bring up one interesting point as um, uh, from the assessment collection perspective. Uh, at this time, through the end of April of last year, we had collected approximately $3.5 million in, in assessments. At the end of April this year, we've actually collected $4.2 million worth of the assessments. So I think that's a good sign. Hopefully, uh, you know, it'll continue and that we won't have as much delinquent accounts as we've had in the past. And clearly, uh, the relief from COVID obviously is showing as a tangible result of being able to collect more money. So again, more to report next month. Uh, again, but making sure that uh, John's team is going through the audit and closing the books for April. And we'll have some more next month. That's it. I'm going to open the floor to public comments. Please give your name and your address if you're going to make a public comment. Seeing no public comments, I'll go ahead and close the floor. <clears throat> there are no capital purchase requests and there are no CPI violations. Unfinished business, uh, we have a discussion on the short term rental recommendations. Frank? Uh, yes, uh, we have the attorney recommendation uh, regarding short-term rental, uh, re regarding short-term rentals. Um, I guess we'll just read the topic. It's the attorney recommendation for declaration of restriction amendment regarding short-term rentals. The more concise statement is recommend recommendation for amending declaration of restrictions to regulate short-term rentals. So <clears throat> we've been working on this thing now for more than two years, and it's been a say the least a pretty interesting process as we've talked with all the stakeholders and certainly i believe the board has given uh clear instructions that we do not want to eliminate short-term rentals we do not want to disrupt the short-term rental market in ocean pines but what we want to do is be able to deal with problem properties when they crop up in a more effective manner than we've seen done in the past so what this recommendation is, which is attached, is to amend the declaration of restrictions in each section to exactly follow the county code, which should have been followed for the past two years. No more restrictive, which is the direction from the board, no less restrictive, which is the rule under Maryland's law. So it is exactly, if you're running short terms, and you're in compliance with the county, you're going to be in compliance with Ocean Pine. <clears throat> no questions asked. The second thing that will happen is we will have the ability to declare or to set up our own penalties for violation and short-term restrictions, and that's where we found the shortcomings with the existing law at the county level. Now, from a just practical standpoint, our job is to stay in our own lane and not to deal with anything that goes on down in Snow Hill, and we're gonna continue that. But every single stakeholder that we've talked with from the county has explained to us clearly <coughs> that they do not have the resources, nor do they have the budget to increase the resources to enforce their current legislation. So that falls upon us to do that. And we can do that with this attorney recommendation. But Frank, my, my question, I think this has been the big question for this all along is how are we going to enforce it ourselves? Yeah. What's the what's going to be the mechanism? Well, I, I think it's kind of an interesting thing because uh, and I'll draw a comparison only because I can give you a comparison based on my experience. I used to live in Columbia. Columbia has a a proactive aggressive enforcement of their CPI rules, okay? Each year in Columbia, somebody walks around to your property, they determine that your house number has the right font, the right size, the right color, your door is the right color, or your shutters are the right color, your property's in good repair, there's no chip paint and stuff like that, and if there is, you get a violation immediately, okay? On the Eastern Shore, we don't have that mentality, and I don't think we want that mentality in our association. We have a complaint-driven system. So that is, if you're well-behaved, there's no complaints. 
if you decide to bring in great train robbery for a 2 a.m. concert in your neighbor's driveway, <laughs> okay, you get a complaint and the police come out and people deal with it. And that's how this system will be dealt with. And, you know, I've talked with people that are, you know, quite frankly opposed to regulations because they're saying, well, we're concerned that your overreaching is going to be more restrictive. No, we're not going to overreach. We're concerned that you want to do this. No, we don't want to do this. But if you, and if you run it for 20 years and if you've not had any problems, we would never anticipate a problem. The truth is we have never experienced a problem with a property that has a Worcester County short-term rental license. But with properties that are rented short-term that don't have that license, we've had mega problems and so has the county. So if you have a complaint, we'll address it. But if there's no complaint, we're not going to go out looking for trouble. And that's how we do with our regular DRs. And quite frankly, it works real well. How many months have we gone without a complaint on this agenda for CPI violations? And we'll just follow the same process. But when somebody comes up like we had last year, and Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, because you were there, and a person looks at us and says, I'm not going to change what I'm doing for you or the county because it's going to affect my income until you can come and throw out my tenants. Right? If somebody looks at that and says, we want to play ball with hardball with you, we're going to look them back in the eyes and say, welcome to the big leagues. But, uh, Frank, and I understand all that, but it's my question still is, how are we going to enforce this? Is it going to be the art committee or are we going to react to complaints? Um, is it, you know, it, it, I know at some point we were talking about the police department. I mean, how, how are we going to, assuming, yeah, no, no, assuming we, assuming we have a situation like Abishar. Yeah. Here's what would happen, Larry, different from last year. The police would come out there like they, they did and they couldn't do anything like they, they said they couldn't do. They would notify John. Okay. John would notify the CPI department. Okay. The CPI department would then, as they do right now, validate the complaint and notify the owner that you've had this problem, okay, and give them a warning, right? Past that, if there's another complaint, as John's empowered to do right now under the declaration of restrictions, he can immediately go to the enforcement. And the enforcement would be variable by board because, uh, just also for the record, a little side thing, most people aren't aware, but since 1995, the board has had the ability to levy fines in sections developed after 1995. They've never used it. When you expand this to short-term rentals, if you run into a situation where somebody's egregious, the board can set fines for the upcoming year that would dissuade bad behavior. And if there's no complaints, then there's no fines. And they can change that on an annual basis just like we do right now on a number of things that, that affect individual properties, like delinquencies. So are we going to have to change the DRs just in the section prior to 1995? Or do uh, we have to do them all? We'd have to do them all because it would regulate short-term rentals in all sections. And right now, to my knowledge, Larry, for specific, and Tom can correct me if I'm wrong, but the park both has the ability to and does regulate short-term rentals and they have the ability to level fines. And they have a system Right. And then there was just one other point I wanted to make because in having discussions with in this with Joe Moore and with Jeremy, um, the process of doing the DRs is not a referendum process. This is a straight uh, up down vote from the owners in those particular. Uh, properties. Now, there'll be expense incurred because we have to mail uh, the ballots out to them, but it is a, uh, uh, a majority vote one way or the other. And again, it would not require a referendum. Correct. And, and I think we have the ability to use our heads here because, look, one of the complaints that came up as this discussion moved forward during, during this, up, this rental season was just like two years ago when the county passed the regulation, and I think it was in March, it was sprung on people and they had contracts. For all practical purposes, this is not going to be implemented until next season. Okay? 
So we have the ability to use our heads because the first to address the expense, uh, if I looked at Cami's numbers that she gave for the referendum the other day, it looks like an initial mailing would cost on the order of $5,000. Okay, and that includes with the bounce back cards. But subsequent mailings can be made and included in any association mailing that goes out to the homeowners. So if a section requires, doesn't get their 50% vote to go up or down, you can send that out, for example, with the assessment. We could send it out with the normal publications that we have and eliminate the mailing expense. So we're not looking at anywhere near the expense level of a referendum. Yes, Cammie. Frank, so um, I'm a homeowner, and in my neighborhood, there's a wild party with 20 million people there or whatever. My first step is to call the police, correct? The police have advised us during this whole discussion that that if you have a problem with somebody throwing a wild party, call the 911 number. Okay. Okay. People are reluctant to do that. I'm going to give you what, try to the best of my knowledge, give you verbatim what the chief gave us. If you call 911, that call was handled and the record of that call was handled in a completely def different system than if you call the non-emergency number or if you stop by the police station. If you call the 911 number, and it's, it's a certain number of 911 calls made to, to report a disturbance at a certain home. There is county laws in effect that the police can, can work on. Okay. But if you stop by the police station or call the non-emergency number, it's an entirely different system. And, you know, it seems like it's, uh, I can't use the word here because I'll, I'll get in trouble. It, it, it seems like, I'll just use the initial, it seems like a CS kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the fact is, as you know, as an attorney, when you go to court, they expect this kind of documentation. They don't get it. It doesn't count. And that's what, what we're up against. And one of the problems with Abbey Showers, the neighbors were reluctant to call 911. They would stop by the police. They would call the non-emergency number. And that, in effect, stopped the police from, from going on a course of action that could have corrected that situation. So we had an issue because I when we were working on this team, we had an issue with inspections. Yes. What can you, for the people here, and I guess for those who are watching this from home, what can you tell us about what the final decision was on inspection of the home? So with the inspections, I had to, just to give everybody the truth, I had an interesting conversation with somebody that lives on High Sheriff Trail. They have a short-term rental that is directly behind them and they have a Worcester County rental license. And the person said, Frank, come on over and measure my rooms. You, they're within an inch. And so in his complaint originally was the way that our original document was drafted, it would have reduced its capacity. I said, okay, I understand that. So we'll take care of that. And we did. And he said, but you know, I have a real complaint and a real, again, can't use the word, with the county about these short-term rentals because people are cheating. And I said, what do you mean people are cheating? He said, under the county system, you draw a floor plan for the bedrooms. And some people are cheating. They're showing closets that don't exist. They're showing egress that doesn't exist. And the county doesn't do inspection. So we said, okay, we'll have a home inspector come in and do that. And there was pushback because then you're entering somebody's home mm -hmm. and you're violating their rights. And, and I completely understand that. So what we are going to do is follow the county guidelines, which is you submit a floor plan, you do it to scale, you show the egress, you show the closets, and send in a picture with it. And that will eliminate that cheating. Okay. Because the person on High Sheriff Trail brought an interesting point. He said, you tell me if they're not cheating, how somebody that has a house, okay, one half my size, can have the same amount of people. And by the way, I will tell you for the record, there is a VRBO house advertised in Ocean Pines that has the same occupancy of 16 people, at 1,700 square feet, as another house does on Lee Drive that has 6,000 square feet. And it just doesn't make sense. Doug? Yeah, and, and listening to all of this discussion, we've been back and forth, a lot of ideas have been traded, but it seems to me that one of the 
one of the issues here is, and I go back to the concept of enforcement. I think right now what our challenge needs to be is to find out a consistent way to have a process for enforcement that we all agree upon and that we socialize with the uh, with the membership, okay? Uh, there are noise abatement uh, laws on the books in Worcester County. They actually have decibel levels and so on and so forth. Of course, how practical is that? Who's going to walk out there with a decibel meter and decide whether or not it's 55 decibels after 11 o'clock? It's not going to happen. It's not practical. But I, I think if we focus on providing some process, some consistent process, uh, and, and obviously authorize that process, I think it'll go a long way in addressing these kinds of issues. Two other things come to mind. Although I know we can't, we can't fix it because, it, quite frankly, it exists right now, but since the DRs are section by section, we have the potential of there being an inconsistency. The following sections, you can provide fines. These other sections, you can't. So I think we need to bear that in mind as we go forward and try to make sure that we promote the idea of some level of consistency when it comes to uh, enforcement of short-term rentals you know, as we go through all of the sections of Ocean Pines. Because, you know, as you said right now, we all know that, you know, anything after uh, 1995, we do have the power to mm -hmm. fines, but prior to that, we don't. So I look for some level of consistency, but I think the major thing that we need to do is really agree upon uh, the best way to enforce and, and make sure those authorizations, you know, maybe, maybe it is fining, maybe it is something along those lines, but I think we need to, the work needs to be done on establishing that process. What? Yeah, um, Doug, I agree with um, the idea of consistency of process. Um, the other issues, I think the noise issue, you talk about the practicality. If somebody is going to come out and respond to a noise complaint, they need to have the equipment to do that measurement. If they're there, it's not impractical. That equipment is available. You know, we could certainly look at adding that into our budget. The other two kind of complaints that we get have to do with parking every place and trash every place. Are there county regulations that we're going to be able to fall back on to address those? Yeah, right. let me let me address at least there are beside just the short term run not having a license and falling to Worcester County law. There are three problems that we run into. We run into trash. We run into noise and we run into parking, okay? Uh, Worcester County Code has, I believe the exact code, and I could get it for you on my smartphone, is PH1-101, covers litter. We can incorporate that and follow the county regulations exactly for litter and trash. The county has regulations for noise. We could incorporate that just by adding three or four words, okay? And I think we should look at doing that because there's also in the county code, if you read it, some very strict, I mean, it's it's not nebulous. It's very precise, okay? And then for noise, we'd have to get the police department, number one, and the chief and John to enforce it and get them the equipment to enforce it for noise. Parking, I would suggest this. Nobody wants to touch parking at any level of government that I can, that I've been able to identify on the Eastern Shore, okay? And it's simply because we've grown up with certain situations here in Ocean Pines. And it's like Larry explained to me last year. Okay, so you have a short-term rental and they come in and they bring in 15 cars. Okay, and that causes a problem. So if you regulate that, you also have to be able to deal with this. It's like I'm having a birthday party tonight. And Larry was telling me last year he had, an, uh, I think it was an anniversary or birthday party. And there's going to be a whole bunch of people come. And there's only a certain number of people that you can fit in your driveway per county code. So they're going to be out in the street parking. So we've grown up with 50 years of that. And I think in that case, we should follow the, the, the old wisdom of let a dead dog lie. Okay? And if we have to deal with it in the future, or if a board has to deal with it in the future, let's deal with it. But it's really a, a tough situation. And at the county level, by the way, they have dealt with it because, or tried to deal with it because the old building code used to require two 20 by 10 parking spaces to build a home, unstacked. So if you drive around Ocean Pines and you have two 
20 by 10 spaces, you can probably get four cars in that driveway. The new code, and I think it was adopted in January 1st of 2020, requires now three parking spaces. So you can get six. And it gets down to a situational basis because I mentioned earlier a home on Lee Drive that's on VRBO. I looked at the aerials and drove by it. They could put they could put literally in their driveway 15 cars and keep it off the street. The small home with 1,700 square feet, it's going to go out on the it's going to go out on the street for parking. But then you get into the question of should they have that many many people in that home anyway? by the county regulations. If they can do it and they follow the regulations, we just have to live with the parking. And so, Frank, I, two uh, things, oh, just as follow-up. One, it sounds like what you're saying is that we would need to adopt the county regulations for noise and litter. In that is the, correct. Okay, secondly, mm -hmm. the culture that you talk about, I agree that there is a culture, parking party culture, that we have in Ocean Pines, for example, if my neighbor is going to have a noisy party and have extra cars, he'll come over and tell me, and he'll even give me a nice bottle of scotch to compensate <laughs> for, my, you know, for my inconvenience. But with uh, the proliferation of short-term rentals, this is not a once-a-summer event. It's an every-weekend event for some of these people. Yeah. And that good neighbor culture does not prevail. Two points. Number one, I'd like to swap neighbors <laughs> and get a bottle of scotch. <laughs> the, the second is, I think at that point, Colette, you know, the other thing that is kind of maybe we haven't given just due with, we have a very good working relationship with the county and everybody at the county, including the commissioners, the county staff has worked very hard with us and they've, they've been very responsive and and have worked with us to make this thing work. I think if we as a board or a future board feels there's a parking problem in Ocean Pines, that's the time to sit down with the commissioners and talk with them and see what we can do community-wide. But it is going to be an issue that, you know, it, it, it's just, um, it, it's kind of like a radioactive issue because if you do it for short-term rentals, based on everything we've done so far, I can tell you the attorneys are going to say, then we have to do it for long-term rentals. And we have to do it for full-time residents. Well, let, me, let me interject on this, Frank. That, so, again, we talked, you're talking about the party we had at my place uh, a few years now. And beforehand, I talked to the chief, and I knew there was going to be a lot of cars. And his comment to me was, there's really nothing we can do about it as long as the cars are not blocking the road. Um, the problem that we run into here in Ocean Pines is everybody thinks that the berm belongs to them, and it doesn't. Um, so the chief uh, indicated that, you know, if the people are parked on the grass, and it's, you know, not the homeowner's property, they're not blocking the, the driveways, and they're not blocking the street, then they're fine. Two wheels they're off the street. Do, they're not going to do anything. Tom? All right. Good question. So this, Frank, this um, section is TR2-106. Mm -hmm. Is that in the guidelines already, or is this the new portion that you're trying to put in? No, that's in the county county okay, legislation. So, so, this is all pure county legislation. Okay, Tom. so here's my issue. And this has always been my issue. It's never going to change. Um I don't believe that we need another enforcement issue in the pines and restrictions on anything. I certainly don't believe we need any fee structure on getting rental licenses for Ocean Pines property. And it states right in here that, that and provides that after providing the owner of the licensed property an opportunity to be heard, the county commissioner, the county commissioner may revoke, suspend, or refuse to renew any rental license issued due to material falsification rental license, blah, 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 due to anything that they may decide. My opinion is this has been such a hot topic, and I, we've talked about this, that we have enough people behind it in Ocean Pines to put a little pressure on the commissioners to actually start enforcing all of these regulations in this rental, in the rental agreement. It's just that simple. I mean, they're making all the money. They're putting it in their pocket. I, I pay my $200 per rental property to them every year. 
there should be a little bit of extra that they can pay somebody to go enforce these things, to go and look at the property, to get pictures and and do that review. They have one girl, as far as I know, at this rental at the at the rental licensing department, and she was the same one that was there last year. So I understand your process. We've talked about it in length. My opinion is personally, we put together a, a group and 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 try and position, go to a commissioner's meeting and say, look, you have this. I can get. 10,000 people that are paying this $200 a year and they're going to go, if you, if you, if we're getting them, if, we, if we're spending the money, why don't you have a way to enforce it for the bad apples, which is 0.05% if that, I mean, it's really not that big. So that's always been my opinion. And my mic, I've yeah, talked too long. No, but you're not talking. That's, that's where I, that's where I am. And I know to enforce it, through Ocean Pines to have a CPI inspector go out there or something like that. It's hard enough to enforce moss on the roof and, and things that we have problems with. I just don't see us getting involved in that and it being a good thing. Well, your, your point's well taken, but let me respond to that. I would say this, get your group together and go down to the county commissioners as a private citizen. That's not the board's purview to do that. But in the meantime, okay, we have ex firsthand experience with a county law and a problem property. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. Uh, oh, no, I, I beg to differ. Why did the Abbey Shire property get solved? Okay. Did it the go Abbey to court or did not go to court? No, hold on. Let's talk facts then, not fantasies. I'm not fantasies. Okay. Bef at the first complaint of the year, when we went out and Doug went out, right, as board president, it was made clear to us that the person that owned Abbey Shire was going to sell the house. So them selling the house, which eliminated the problem, it had nothing to do with the county enforcement. There are 102 rental days between Memorial Day and Labor Day. They were advertising that house at $400 a night. Okay? When the commissioners went out there to get the enforcement for Ed Tudor, he and his staff had to drive by that house every day to validate a citation so they could go to court this, so that when they testified in court, they could say, yeah, we gave the citation because we saw this doing, doing that. They're not going to be able to drive by every day on a single house in Ocean Pines. They don't want to do it. They've been instructed not to do it. They don't have the resources to do it. In that time frame, okay, that person at $400 a day made over $43,000 in rental. Okay, the county commissioners got involved, okay, brought the weight of the county there, started writing citations, it was at the beginning of the summer, and in February, the court fined that owner $500. So you go through the whole season of the neighbors being tormented, you go through the whole season of the county doing what they can do, you go through a whole season of somebody making $40,000 a year, and they get fined $500. And the owner wasn't even fined. So here's the thing. I would say, take your point, and by the way, I don't think it's a bad point, and I don't disagree with it at all. Go down to the county commissioners. If this is on the books, and the county commissioners do what I believe you're saying is their job, then we don't have a problem, and we don't have to spend any money on enforcement. If they do, don't do their job, which ha clearly happened last year, or I won't say didn't do their job, they weren't effective in doing their job, right? Then you don't have the neighbors running around with their heads exploding and their hairs on fire asking us why we're spending a million plus for a police department that can't do anything. And we step in and I will grant you, we do the job somebody else should be doing on their legislation. But guess what? It's then us handling our problem with our neighbors with a problem property rather than going down Snow Hill. But I'm not discouraging what you're saying because if they do their job, we don't have to do it. And I don't disagree with anything you said. And I know that they only find them $500. My point is, is that they don't have enough, if they don't have enough employees or people, staff to do this job, then hire more staff. They have an opportunity to find somebody, but it takes them six months and let's work with them to fix it. So they find somebody $500 a day instead of $500 in six months. That makes a difference. I think that the, the issue is, is that as Larry said, we can't enforce parking on the sides of the street. We, there's just issues, and we're going to go to referendum in every different section. And again, as Doug said, it could we could have sections that we can't enforce and sections that we can. I just believe that that our 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 
focus should be on getting the county to do what they say they're supposed to do rather than us coming up with a whole new set of rules and regulations and doing it ourselves. That's just my opinion. And that, you know, and I, I think that if we put together a grassroots effort, there have been bigger other issues that we've done that have come together that we could be able to do that. So that's, I mean, that's just where I stand. You know, no, no, I, by the way, I, not just, I, I, I know. look, if you want to put together a grassroots effort, I'll sign up for it. Right. But my point is, I think that we are remiss in our duty as a board when we can do something and some to, to alleviate a problem, given the fact, and I'll give you 100%, that maybe the county should be doing a heck of a lot better job than they are. But if they're not doing their job, that doesn't alleviate the fact that by not doing anything, we're not doing ours. I agree. And but you have to also realize this legislation has been on the books for less than two years the second full year of this rental this rental licensing period. Last year was their first. They put it together. They obviously didn't do much of anything. And this year they do. They're a lot more enforceable. All of the all the leasing companies, Heilman, Caldwell Banker, all of them have to get it in order to lease any of their property. So it's obviously growing bigger and bigger for them as well. So I'm just, you know, my thing is a little pressure on them might get them to do a little bit more enforcement. And Tom, from, I'll sign up for that too. Okay. Yeah. I'll be more than happy to sign up for that. And um, and I hope that, you know, with, with Greg and Josh and everybody that's here that they keep this up front. I just have two quick observations on this. The noise ordinance is really tough because the noise ordinance is measured in decibels. And in order to find somebody with a violation of a new noise ordinance, you have to show that 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 particular machine has been continuously calibrated and the person who operated is trained to do so. So, you know, that's a, that's a kind of can be, eh. but one of the things that I talked to Joe more about is that if we have these problematic properties, you know, folks, we can take this to a judge in Worcester County. We can get an injunction and we can present evidence to the judge that this person needs to be shut down. That is, you know, that's not a straw that we necessarily want to go to, but it's one we can go to if it becomes so disruptive in a neighborhood that it, it's just out, out of the question to all the homeowners. Right, is there any other discussions on this? So we, we'll check out. Yeah. Uh, you know, this work group that you're going to put together, Tom, to grassroots effort this, um, it sounds like what you need to be focusing on is encouraging the Enfor enforcing the county to right. engage in timely enforcement, not something that's weeks, months, or half a year down the road from the infraction, and that the penalty is significant. So it's rapid and significant penalties. So is that what you're signing on for here? I mean, I will go and personally talk to Chip and Jimmy for, uh, first off and see what their, uh, what their thoughts are on it then I will get together and figure out which direction we need to go in order to get those things implemented. But I and think if, if it, we can't... If it's, if it's available, and if it's not, we'll get the public involved again. Because yeah. there are a lot of short-term rental people that are here that don't want to see the properties like Abbey Shire. I would say the majority of them, 99% of them, yeah. don't want to see that because it's a black eye on them. So, yes, I mean, I will, I will go in and talk to those guys. Hopefully, I can give them a call this week. But my understanding is that the county's already told us that they can't do timely and they can't do significant. And that's why we're here. Because they don't have a staff. Because they and don't want to so spend money on If staff. that can be resolved, fine. But I, I agree with, with, with Frank that the failure of the county to do what they should be doing does not absolve us of our responsibility. And, that, and that's really the issue that the county, I, I mean, I've spoke with Chip and Jim Bunting from the very beginning on this. And they made it perfectly clear they were not going to push for enforcement. As a matter of fact, if you remember, neither of them voted for this county uh, short-term rental re regulation. Neither, both of them voted against it. And um, besides that, the penalties are in there. If I remember correctly, it's $50 for the first day, $100 every day after that. Well, there are the penalties. It goes to court. And unfortunately, the judge only awarded five or fifty dollars or five hundred dollars so it's it's not as easy as saying let's make the county do what they're going to do i, I mean 
I didn't say it was easy. I just said, let's go in that direction and try it. I mean, you, the more it happens, as you know, the more things, the more publicity it gets, yep. the more it actually gets people start paying more attention. Yep. I mean, if you don't do anything, you just sit here and go, okay, let's put together a regulation for ocean pines and let's figure out how to enforce it and let's figure out what the fines are going to be and let's figure out what the cost is going to be per as short term rental person. And then, you know, and then for me, I'd rather go the other route and say, look, let's just start getting them to yeah, at least give it a try. If you don't ask, you don't know. I mean, that's the point. And you did ask, but if more people ask, get more more publicity on it is this a possibility i'm just saying it's possible well it's start, this is not where i want to go i'm saying tom start the effort i will we can run in parallel with it i agree and worst case i mean absolute worst case situation the county could adopt stronger stronger penalties they could increase their budget they could increase their staff and you know what we have something on our declaration of restrictions that we simply wouldn't enforce <laughs> but i'll just submit to you we went through this with our regular declaration of restrictions two years ago, okay? And it has been, if you go back literally months since we've seen a CPI violation on our board agenda. And the reason is, is we've had a way to enforce them now fast, okay? And this is a way to do it. And if the county wants to go their route, that would be great. But that doesn't put us, you know, We've dealt with, if you start this thing and, and you really put a timeline on it, Abby Shar started now five seasons ago. And the can has been kicked down the goddamn road five years. And going your route will kick it down for six. I'm just saying, but you know what? I wasn't a part of it for four of them. So That's I, right. can't, I can't do anything about the four Neither years was before I. we were. Neither so. was I. But it's, we're, we're sitting here now when it's our job now. Got it. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and close the discussion on this topic. I think uh, I think I think everybody got their points in, um, and there'll be more discussion coming on this. One point, okay. This could become a motion next meeting. The question is, we canceled a town hall. Do we want to now? First off, this should be now public, and we should release it that the way that Josh does to all the media on all the websites. This is what we want to do, okay. Do we want to have a town hall to get the input from people? Because people certainly want to give input, and we've certainly used it to get this far. How do we want to proceed before we go to a motion? We can do a town hall. I have no problem with doing a town hall. Um, and, um, you know, because we know we've got uh, people on both sides of this argument. So, yeah, we can do a town hall if, uh, you know, I don't, <clears throat> I just don't want to waste time. Uh, you know, going over the same issues, but I have no problem doing town hall. Because we board can, would like to do it, then we can do it. And no that would be my. Let's do a town hall between now and the June meeting, and this will be a motion in June. We'll see if we can set a date. We'll try to get one uh, as we had set before. Okay. Um, uh, next issue is the uh, motion regarding the uh, lease for secrets parking, Colette. Yeah, the motion is to approve a five-year lease with secrets for OPA Ocean City Oceanside parking lot for $60,000 with a 3% per year escalation clause with secrets paying the property taxes as well as a two-year extension of the existing Bayside parking lot lease with effective dates for the two leases coinciding with, coinciding with each other. The purpose and effect is to allow secrets to lease the LPA Oceanside parking lot and to align the renewal time frame of base of the Bayside lease with the timeline of the Oceanside lease. Is there a second? Second. And any discussion? All in favor of the motion? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain. Tom abstain. <coughs> Okay, yeah, uh, that's the end of uh, uh, old business or unfinished business. Uh, new business, uh, we have a first reading on the repeal of Resolution B08. Frank? Okay. Um, it's actually quite short. Uh, the topic is repeal of Resolution B08. Uh, the purpose of this uh, first reading is to repeal Resolution B08 in its entirety. 
and I have included in the board packet uh, the items that I'd have in the discussion, which you all have had. So I see no reason to read it unless somebody wants to go through point by point. Discussion? Since it's the first reading, we don't, there's no motion necessary at this point. Do you want to schedule uh, a second? We'll set the second reporting. reading for uh, repealing resolution B08 will be in June. I just have a quick discussion. It's just a, a small issue. And I know we talked about trying to be an email, or be a email. But I just have some, an issue with this coming up. And we put together committees for a reason to discuss B08 and go over and to have meetings and, and discuss it. I have a, a real issue with you, but with it coming up and us three of us who were on the committee not knowing anything about it until it popped up. And I know you said a couple me a few meetings ago that if nothing happens, I'm going to bring this up as a repeal, but it just would have been nice to re just to reach out to the committee and say, hey, by the way, this is what I'm thinking about doing. I want to bring it up first reading. Of our, you know, that's all. Just a communication. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And Tom, your point is well taken. But look, when we sit here at a board meeting and I sit here in March and I say exactly what I said, B08 is in serious trouble. Okay, and if your committee doesn't come up with something by the May 15th meeting, I'm going to put a motion forth to repeal it. Okay, that in effect puts the ball in your court. I totally agree. I'm just saying we don't have we have a issue with communication on this board as it is. I just think it would have been a courtesy to call, say, look, I'm putting this in rather than just pop up. That's just me personally, and I just because we did have a meeting and we had a committee. Put these committees together for short-term rentals and for everything else. Mm -hmm. And usually we have discussion about it, the Bainbridge project, the drainage, and things of that nature. That's all. That's yeah. just, you know, if we're going to have committees and we're going to have groups of people putting together information about getting rid of a resolution or making a resolution better, I would just like to have communication. With them. Perfectly, perfectly understood. But let me ask a question. Has your committee met? Yes. Okay. I'm perfectly willing to admit in the way that the bylaws are set up, friendly amendments, there's reading. So the committee has 30 days to come up with the recommendations that they would like. My first reading is strike it out in its entirety. I would assume that if you guys are following the bylaws, that your first, that your friendly amendment for the second reading will come in with a marked up version of B08 that's called for in the book of resolutions with the changes that you all want as a work group to fix the known deficiencies that we have in it. And it, you have 30 days to do that. It might come up as a, just a repeal BOA. It's not a question. I'm, I'm really, that, that wasn't an issue I'm, I'm bringing up, but thank you for giving us 30 days. We'll have another meeting and discuss it. And let you know. All right. Uh, next item is um, uh, Colette, the first reading on succession planning and GM position documents. Yeah, um, these are policy documents um, to support planning succession for the general manager position. It's the internal succession planning process for GM and level one positions, paper, the um, updated job description for the general manager position, and a document outlining general manager qualifications and required skills that was generated in consultation with our current GM and the consultant group that we've been working with. And the purpose and effect of this is to provide guidance for planning and succession for the general manager position. And so these are, um, the, um, you know, these are just a review at this point. Any discussion? Right, uh, these are the same documents we reviewed couple months ago and uh, worked on uh, that, the, that the board looked at, uh, I think, during closed session. Are these the same documents? They, they've been updated. We okay. made some revisions based on the input from the um, consultant and based on discussion of our work. Hey, Doug? Yeah, point of order. Um, you actually don't have to, in this particular case, have a first and second reading for acceptance of policy documents. Uh, the only actually thing, and I, I did the research on uh, Robert's Rules of Order, we have the option of accepting these updated documents today uh, as now. Again, if you don't want to, that's fine. But there, there was just point out that there's no requirement to have two readings. The, the things that drive two readings is in our own governance documents for resolution, Okay, whether you're going to you know, accept a resolution or repeal a re resolution. 
they're in our governance documents to do two readings. But you know, if you wanted to think about the option of not doing two readings for this one, you have that. Just just a point of order. Okay, thanks for doing that research, Doug. That would be my preference to go ahead and approve it today. Okay. And so I'm accepting a friendly amendment that this be a motion <laughs> rather than a first reading. Well, then you need to oh. put forth a oh. motion. I'll move that we accept the documents as presented uh, for approval. I second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That motion passes. Okay. Uh, the next uh, new business item is uh, Doug to Jenkins Point. Motion. The motion is to approve an expense of $10,000 for the design and permitting requirements for the Jenkins Point proposal. The purpose and effect is this expense will establish a commitment by Ocean Pines to move forward with the requested funding from the state DNR for the proposed project. In the background, it was a, and this was taken from the um, uh, Maryland Coastal Bay's uh, submission, the Jenkins Point Restoration for Resilience <coughs> Project seeks to enhance resiliency for the Ocean Pines and Osprey Point residential communities and adjacent recreational and community facilities through the design, permitting, and ultimate implementation of a natural and nature-based restoration of Jenkins Point, an eroding peninsula in the Isle of White Bay to strengthen natural infrastructure and thereby protect communities from the adverse impacts of climate change, including the increasing frequency and intensity of coastal storms resulting in shoreline erosion and flooding. Is there a second? No okay. second. Right, discussion. Uh, I have some. I have. Uh, I have discussion on this. Yeah. Um, First off, I'm, I, I want you to understand I support this Jenkins uh, Point project. However, my concern is that when we were first contacted about this, and we had discussions with Maryland Coastal Bays, they made the commitment was that Ocean Pines would not have to incur any expense for the engineering portion of it. That was their initial commitment, and that um, what the work that was going to be done, as as you as we know, could be two million, four million dollars, and that in fact grants would cover that. We would not be chipping in for that. My concern is that just like what happened with the Bainbridge project, we were originally told things. And in fact, as we move further on down the pipe, we're paying over $250,000. Now, 10, 000, I agree, $10,000 is no problem. Um, I'm going to vote yes for this. But I want to make clear that, that this is what we've been told before. And my concern is we're going to move down the line. And, and you know, $10,000 I don't have a problem with after... If they're coming, if they're going to come back to us for more engineering costs, and we end up, John showed the slide earlier today, our engineering costs on Bainbridge were $121,000, in addition to the $32,000 that went to the county that originally we were told we were going to get all that money back and we're not getting it back. I just want to make sure the board understands that's what did go on with the Bainbridge project. And again, I. I am full support of the Bainbridge project too. I think it's the right thing to do. I just want to make sure we're we, our eyes are wide open as we go into this, that we're not thinking that this is just going to cost us ten thousand dollars. Now I hope I'm wrong. I hope that you know ten thousand dollars earnest money basically is what this is. That at the end of the day they don't come back and say, well, we need additional engineering done and you've got to pick up the tab. That's just my. Comma and comma first. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm in. I'm in favor of it, obviously, um, with the exception of making sure my cousin who lives at Lake Yonkers is going to be able to get a good clean energy spot. We're going to go all the way out in the ground for more gas. Um, but, but it does a couple of things for ocean pines. Obviously, for nor'easters, it's going to protect that back bay from a, from the yacht club and from Pines Point Provision, Pines Point Marina, and Osprey Point. It also creates another opportunity for vegetation and shell life and things that also filter the water, <coughs> especially being around. I know we're a clean marina, but whenever you're around a marina like that with fuel and different things, it's always you always have issues with, with water quality and it's, it's 
great to have more shoreline out there to actually filter it as it comes in and out of our back bays. Um, as far as the as far as the money goes, the ten thousand dollars obviously is just the earnest money, and the money we spent at Bainbridge, yeah, it wasn't what we anticipated, but it's a project that was so long overdue that if this project gets going and we need to be on top of it and approve monies for it. We'll do it as a board and we'll look into it and make sure that we're not going down the same road and the same avenue where we get surprised by any funding. But this is a very important project and they're working with us and, and if we can get it done, um, I, I am in full favor because it does so much for the river and what we're trying to do throughout Ocean Pines, alleviating a lot of our problems from runoff flooding so i'm all in favor go to frank and then doug yeah this is your motion you can go last yeah i mean first i support it okay and, and i support your earnest money i i think that um you know what happened on bainbridge uh, i think we've looked at i think that that's been correct and i don't anticipate it uh what i do think that we should do oh is again make it real clear that that this is a project to clear clean water and to protect our shoreline. It's not a drainage project. And and I think that, you know, as we go down, I can see now that we're going down two tracks. One wa one is a clean water track, water filtration track. One is a drainage track. And just things being what things are, people tend to confuse them. And I don't want to we have to be very clear in our communications that we are in fact doing this. We're going for clean water, we're going for protecting the shoreline, where this is not a, 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 a storm water management project, okay, so that we don't get that. Because I suspect again that on Bainbridge, we're gonna have a heavy rain and somebody's gonna get flooded and we're gonna hear, I thought this was gonna take care of it. And that's not the intent and it was never the intent. So we have to be clear. The other thing, too, going down the road, guys, I got to tell you, there's one drainage project that we've looked at that really will affect stormwater, and it's big money. And if we go down the path of clean water and stormwater, we're going to be looking at some significant expenditures, this board, not exactly, but future boards that are uh, kind of, you know, they get your attention real quick. We've been looking at those for years. We just haven't yeah. no Done anything so now That's we why. Are. And, and the reason, and the, and the obviously, the thing with Bainbridge is it, it is not, it is, a, it is a drainage solution or partial solution, but the only reason we got the DNR grant was because of the water filtration and the way the pond was structured to do it. Otherwise, there was no DNR grant. They won't fund for drainage, yeah. they're funding for clean water. So it, it's part and parcel together. That's the only reason. Yeah, there's, there's, like that. There, there's help on each one in that case. And you know, I'm, by the way, I'm all for it. But, you know, like I've given you guys numbers because I've looked at drainage with public works. And here's the fact. To maintain our existing system. Okay, let's make it public. Maintain our existing drainage system the way that it was designed. Okay? Underground pipes and ditches. And if you put them on the same program that you do as the bulkheads, but on a 20-year cycle instead of a 30-year cycle, the base assessment goes up $1,000. So when somebody throws around drainage as let's do a drainage project, understand the magnitude of the numbers we're talking about and why past boards have kicked the can down the road. Let's hope the Yacht Club makes a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Doug? Yeah, so um, if you refer back to the email that I sent everybody, you know, showing what we were talking about when I met with uh, Kevin Smith and Steve Farr from Maryland Coastal Bays, the, the real... The indication was that uh, right now it's very favorable. DNR wants to fund these kinds of projects, okay? And uh, and they're going with the intent of asking, you know, the state DNR to fund this project and not put any onus on, on Ocean Pines. However, as we know, we need to be very mindful of, you know, those kinds of things and be very aware that uh, we don't have... Um, you know, kind of this free spending, uh, you know, ability, you know, in order to complete this project. I think the other thing that's really important is, unlike a drainage issue or a water filtration issue, this is a protection issue. They yeah. point out in the, and I, I'll read something from the uh, the submission, is that, you know, many, you know, Osprey Point and Pines Point are the two areas that get affected, including the Yacht Club, you know, in the areas right around that. And they, a couple of interesting statistics is that um, 
that lay with Osprey Point, many of the townhomes sit within 50 feet from an unprotected and rapidly eroding Isle of Wight Bay shoreline composed of eroding and fragmenting wetlands. So they're looking at this as a protection mechanism. So, you know, again, I, I think where, and Tom's right, you know, the, the DNR doesn't care about drainage in ocean pines, but they do care about wetlands. They do care about water filtration and, and you know, and abatement, and they care about protecting the shoreline. So I think it's a good faith gesture on our part to say, yes, we're very much interested in the state's philosophy of trying to protect those shorelines. Like I said, you know, I, we absolutely should do this. And then let's see where it leads us, knowing that we can't, uh, we've learned from the issues that we had with Bainbridge and keep a very close eye on as, as the sink progresses. Is there any further discussion? All right. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And no abstentions. Okay, we have one appointment today. Uh, Ann Shockley. Uh, uh, Ann was appointed, uh, was renewed uh, on the art committee, <clears throat> excuse me, last month. And uh, we're going to um, uh, move to uh, make her chairman of the uh, Architectural Review Committee. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's it. Meeting is adjourned. Uh, next meeting is June 16th.